Okay, we are recording, so I guess we can start. <laughs> so you will see as we go through the lectures, they're gonna become shorter and shorter, which is hopefully a good thing. The last one will be 10 minutes. So um, this, this, uh, this lecture is going to start with the uh, introduction more into DVCS itself, the pre-virtual content scattering, which is, as I said, the reaction that gives access uh, more directly, more directly interpretable in terms of GPDs. And I will start showing data finally after diving into past data or theory, I will show you the measurements that were made with JLab at 6GV of DVCS and also show you what we learned from this data in terms of GPD and in terms of structure of the proton. So um, just to summarize what we learned uh, from the previous uh, lecture, so, if uh, uh, we are in this frame of reference uh, in which uh, the proton moves uh, at the speed of light, we can uh, view the proton as a flat surface, as a pancake. And uh, within this pancake, uh, the degrees of freedom of the constituents are given by the transverse position, also called the impact parameter that uh, I introduced earlier, a transverse momentum of the parton and a longitudinal momentum of the parton. And uh, in theory, in principle, there is a, a, um, a structure function that depends on all these three degrees of freedom, and it's called the generalized transverse momentum dependent distribution. But uh, this cannot yet uh, be uh, measured. I mean, uh, theorists have not yet come up uh, with the reactions with which we can possibly measure. So what we do, we forget in the case of the GPD measurement, we forget uh, about the dependence on the transverse momentum of the parton, we integrate over it. And so we get that the GPD is an integral over this uh, uh, transverse momentum of the parton of the generalized TMDs. So the GPDs, uh, as I said, can be measured uh, with DVCS and with other final states. And uh, uh, if we integrate the GPDs over the variable X, we find the pump factors that are measured in elastic scattering. If we integrate on the transverse position, we will find the PDFs that depend only on the longitudinal momentum of the part. And here I summarize uh, a little bit uh, the formalism in QCD, uh, the kind of operator, the nature of the operator and the structure function that uh, we can measure depending on the final state. Okay, so no local diagonal, local non-diagonal, no local non-diagonal. This is the, uh, the different uh, properties of the QCD operators for the three kinds of distribution. So as I said, four GPDs for, for each um, quark flavor and each depending on these three variables. So I'll come now to some more uh, details about uh, this deeply virtual quantum scattering. It's, uh, we like to say, it's the most uh, direct uh, way to access GPDs because it's uh, um, the, the reaction that is more directly interpretable in terms uh, of GPDs. So uh, in the reaction, as I said, uh, we have an electron that uh, interacts via a virtual photon with one of the quarks in the proton, this quark propagates and uh, radiates a real photon in the final state, and then the quark goes back into the proton, having changed this longitudinal uh, momentum fraction by this uh, two uh, xi quantity. And uh, as I said, uh, there are uh, the relevant kinematic uh, um, variables here are Q square, uh, the X Bjorken, which in this case is not directly uh, connected to the longitudinal momentum fraction of the proton of the parton to complicate things a little bit, but it's actually connected to this uh, psi variable via uh, this approximated formula here. And then the other relevant variable is the transverse, uh, the transferred momentum between the initial and the final proton. So uh, this is. DVCS uh, itself, but uh, when we go measure DVCS, uh, uh, it's final state in which there is a, a scattered electron and the proton and the photon, we don't always uh, hit uh, on this diagram. What can happen is that there is another reaction that has exactly the same final state. And this reaction is called beta Heitler. Basically, uh, instead of having the photon that is radiated by one of the quarks of the proton, the photon is emitted via Bremsstrahlung by either the initial or the final electron. 
So this reaction that you see here does not contain any information about the nucleon structure and is calculable in QED thanks to the fact that we know the form factors and we can parameterize the cross-section of beta hydra. So what happened is that when we measure EP gamma, we are measuring a, a convolution of these two processes. And at the amplitude level, the amplitude for the full EP gamma cross, uh, process will have a, a term that is uh, the DVCS term, the beta Heitler term, and then there will be this interference term between the beta Heitler and the uh, DVCS. And in the title, I put uh, friends or enemy uh, DVCS or uh, beta Heitler because uh, in a sense, uh, beta Heitler is an enemy because in uh, given kinematics, it has a cross section that dominates by various uh, orders of magnitude the one of DVCS. So basically it kills the DVCS uh, contribution. On the other hand, this interference has a linear dependence on the GPDs. And so if we can access in particular the interference between beta Heitler and DVCS, we can have a linear uh, um, access to the GPDs, while the DVCS square term of the amplitude will depend in, in the square um, of GPDs, and so it's a bit more complicated to disentangle. So just to give you, yes? There is a, one photon in yeah. both, yeah. yes. Uh, so does the kinematics of that photon um, differ in either? Exactly. Yes. So, I mean, um, the beta Heitler photons are mainly emitted in the direction of either the beam electron or uh, the scattered electron. So there will be peaks in the beta Heitler cross section as a function of this opening angle between uh, the electrons. So while the DVCS has a different kinematical dependence, but we will see it afterwards. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, to give a, a little pictorial view of this interplay between DVCS and Beta Heitler, they, there is this um, analogy uh, with the holography. So basically when you have a holography, you play with the interference, you have a reference light that interferes with the light reflected by the object. And then this project a kind of multidimensional image of the object that you want to look at. And similarly, this happens with the interference term of uh, DVCS and Beta Heitler, which basically uh, produces asymmetries, asymmetries that are measurable because they are big enough. And these asymmetries are linearly uh, dependent on the GPDs. So this is uh, what we mean when we say that with DVCS and beta either we are making an holography of uh, the nucleon. So uh, I said um, DVCS is um, linked to GPDs, but the link is not so easy nor so uh, direct. Uh, what uh, we have here is that uh, the DVCS amplitude uh, is an integral over the variable x of the GPDs plus some other terms. And uh, basically, uh, we can decompose uh, this amplitude into a real and an imaginary part. As you see, the real part is an integral, integral over x of the GPDs, and the imaginary part is the GPD calculated to the point at the point x equal plus xi. So, what we see from here is that from the DVCS amplitude directly, we will not get any information on the X dependence of the GPD. So instead of accessing a three variable quantity, we are going to access what we call a Compton for factors that are a complex object that have a real and imaginary part. And the real part will be this integral on X of the GPD. And the other one will be the GPD calculated at X equal Xi point. So as I said, only the X and T variables will be experimentally accessed uh, via DVCS. And this uh, um, limits a bit uh, the model independent information that we can get from data directly uh, on GPD. So there will be the need for uh, uh, model input or uh, there are other reactions that we could use, but I will talk about that uh, in a couple of lectures. So, um, if we access, if we measure the cross-section of DVCS, we have this 
sum of the amplitudes for the VCS and beta Eitler. If we measure a difference of cross-section, uh, difference uh, with respect to some polarization quantity, and I will come back in the next slide, we access directly the interference term uh, that, as I said, depends linearly on the quantum flow factor. And if we measure an asymmetry, it's going to be the ratio between the cross-section difference and the cross-section sum, and this will be a mixture of the interference term and the beta either square, DVCS square, and interference term. You see here just uh, an image of, um, of this. Here we have uh, a model uh, um, image of uh, a GPD uh, with the dependence on uh, X and Xi, and it's done at T equals zero. And what this image tells us is that the difference of cross-section or the asymmetry that are connected to the interference term give us access mainly to the imaginary quantum for factor. And the imaginary quantum for factor is the GPD at the point X equals Xi. So this is the line on which asymmetry give us access to GPDs. On the other hand, if uh, we measure uh, um, the cross section itself or also double spin asymmetry, which I didn't uh, uh, list here, we are going to have uh, the real part of the quantum for factor, which is then the integral on the X variable. So this is the kind of information on GPDs that DVCS is going to give us. So now formulas, because we didn't have enough uh, yet. So uh, if we look, this is connected to the question that um, you were asking me uh, before. So the, the cross section of the uh, EP gamma final state, uh, the, it's uh, fourfold. Actually, here is five, five fold. There is also add the possible dependence on the phi of the electron, but uh, uh, it's really, uh, there is no dependence on that. So here is a um, uh, kinematic factor, and then we have the amplitude for the process, which, as I said, includes the beta Hitler and the DVCS and the interference term. These three terms can be decomposed in, uh, um, uh, in an expansion depending on the angle pi that is defined as the angle between the leptonic and the hadronic plane. So the leptonic plane is the plane defined by the incoming and the outgoing electron. The hadronic plane is the plane basically of the final state, the plane of the proton and the gamma. So these two planes uh, are, have, a, have an angle, opening angle between them, and you can uh, develop uh, um, the beta Heidler square, DVCS square, and interference term in a series uh, depending on uh, cosine and sinus uh, powers of uh, this angle phi. So uh, you will see that uh, beta Heidler and DVCS and the interference have a different uh, azimuthal dependence on this factor, and this helps us uh, to have uh, to single out uh, the GPDs from um, the observables that we measure. So let's get more into what we can get uh, um, by measuring uh, experimentally DV DV DVCS, uh, having the possibility to have uh, to vary the polarization. What I mean here we are with polarization is that you can either change the polarization of your beam or the polarization of the target. And if you remember here, this graph earlier about the different GPDs, what do they correspond in terms of different polarization of the initial and final state, the target, and so on. Uh, you can build different kind of asymmetry, depending if you have a, a beam, polarized, a polarized beam or a polarized target. And this asymmetry will have a different sensitivity to the different GPDs. And this is the, the beauty of this, because if you can have an experimental program like we do here at Jefferson Lab, that allows you to change the kind of uh, polarization that you have to measure the VCS. So you can ideally sample all, uh, um, all the four uh, uh, quantum form factors and therefore the, G the GPDs. Another, so what you see here, there are these um, uh, expressions for the different kind of observable. For instance, let, let's take this. You have a polarized beam, unpolarized target, so you can construct the difference of the cross-section for the two helicities of the, of the beam. And this difference of cross-section is directly linked, as I said before, to the interference between beta Heitler and the VCS. And the interference between beta Heitler makes appear these factors here that are uh, uh, the, the, the form factors 
that are measured in elastic scattering times the quantum factors that contain the GPDs and some kinematic factors. So changing the polarization, you will see I put in uh, uh, in blue the quantum for factors that we measure. You, you see that they change role in the expression. You have one expression here that is mainly sensitive to the quantum for factor H. And this is due to the fact that F1 is bigger than F2 and that Xi uh, makes this factor smaller and so on. So basically, depending on which uh, spin observable uh, you can measure, you are going to have a different sensitivity on one or the other uh, GPD. At the same time, if we have the possibility to change uh, uh, between proton and, neut and neutron target, we can have a different sensitivity to the GPDs themselves and also sample a different quark composition for the GPDs. As I said before, the GPDs uh, are uh, uh, the GPD of the proton is the sum of quark GPDs. So if you want to sample the different quark flavors of the GPD, you need to combine measurement on proton and neutron. And they will have a different sensitivity to GPD. Here I tried to put in bold face, I don't know if it can be seen, the GPD that is more, uh, uh, the, the GPD to which a given observable is more sensitive. And you see that, uh, Given the fact that uh, the form factors uh, have a different value for neutron and proton, in these formulas, you will have, in the case of the proton, you will have one uh, quantum for factor being more uh, sensitive. Uh, and in the case of the neutron, there will be another one. So you see, for instance, for the beam scene asymmetry on the proton, you will be mainly sensitive to the H GPD of the proton. And for the neutron, you will be mainly sensitive to the E GPD uh, of the neutron. So playing with the spin uh, degrees of freedom and uh, with target types, uh, ideally we could have a, an experimental program allowing us to measure all the GPDs. So to summarize where we are now, I said GPDs give us insights uh, in many aspects of nuclear structure. We can get the tomography of the nucleon, the angular momentum of the part and the distribution of forces in the nucleon. And, uh, we have four GPDs for each quark flavor, and they need to be constrained by our DVCS uh, measurement. Each GPD depends on three kinematic variables, but uh, experimentally with DVCS, we only access two of these variables because X is integrated over. And we have this interference with beta Heidler, which is a mixed blessing because beta Heidler dominates the cross section, but the interference depends linearly on the CFF, and we can access it by polarization asymmetries. So uh, experimentally, we have to measure an exclusive final state that has a small cross-section. So this requires a high intensity beam and a high luminosity and detectors that have a, 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 a large acceptance. We also need polarization observable in order to single out the contribution of the different uh, GPDs. So we need polarized beams and polarized targets and a wide phase space uh, to sample the kinematic dependence of the GPDs. What all this means is JLab. So JLab is the place, uh, the ideal facility uh, to measure uh, DVCS. And in fact, uh, there has been about 15 years of DVCS measurement carried out here and we haven't finished yet. So there is not only JLab because uh, worldwide uh, there has been uh, experiments of the DCS that were also carried out in Europe, in DAISY with the Hermes and H1 and Zeus experiment that they measure different combinations of DCS observables. And there are also experiments done at CERN with the muon beam in COMPASS uh, to measure different kind of uh, uh, observable. And uh, Jefferson Lab, at least in the first generation of DVCS experiments. They were carried out in the hall A and hall B. I don't know which halls, uh, if any one of you is working in JLab, uh, if you have a hall uh, of preference. Anyone works in hall A? Okay, what about hall B? Just you. No, direct to it. Hey, come on, you guys. Oh. Mm -hmm. Juan Sebastian, come on. Okay, and all C? So everybody else is all D? <laughs> no, the theorists, okay. All, uh, all zero, okay. All Z. Okay, so anyway, uh, at the beginning it was mainly all A or B. Nowadays it's gonna be also all C, but I will talk about that tomorrow. So you see here, um, 
a plot showing the Q square range and the X-Bjorken range that was sampled by the different uh, experiments. So you see here the experiments at 6GV Jefferson Lab, which are the ones that I will show in this uh, lecture. And tomorrow we'll talk also about uh, the upgraded CBAF. And you see that the Hermes and the Compass uh, uh, experiments go at lower X uh, the organ. So now if you think about what I said in the previous lecture, now let's be interactive. Uh, what does it mean that uh, JLab is at uh, X above 0 0.1 and that the other experiments are below 0 0.1. What, that, what does this tell us about the kind of uh, patterns we are sampling? You don't say it. Sorry? Valence, where is valence? Okay, valence is JLab. And the rest is what? C and blue ones. Bravo. So she asks a lot of questions, but she. But she's good too. <laughs> okay, so this is an overview of the experimental facility. And this is, uh, I'll focus first on JLab at 6GV, uh, the heart of JLab that you'll probably visit uh, somehow. I don't know if you're going to visit the accelerator mm -hmm. too. Okay, so the heart of JLab is the CBAF accelerator, continuous electron beam facility that uh, in the past was delivering a maximum energy of 6 GV, high current, high polarization, and was allowing the delivery simultaneously to three experimental holes. You have the beam accelerated by going around, around, around here. There are two linear accelerator. And then uh, um, the three holes where the beam can be delivered. The, the beauty of this is that uh, you can deliver simultaneously different currents and different energies to the three holes and the energy changes by the number of passes that you go through uh, the accelerator. So for the GPD measurements, we were uh, uh, they were mainly in hole A and hole B. Why we use different holes to measure the same things? Because the different holes have different uh, properties. Detectors have different property. Uh, in hole A, you have uh, two high resolution spectrometers with a limited coverage, but very high luminosity, so you can run at high currents and get a, a precise measurement of your observables. In all B, uh, my, my place, uh, the class uh, detector has a large acceptance, so allows you to measure um, vast kinematic coverage, and uh, it's very suited for multiparticle final states, such as the exclusive reaction, but the luminosity is, is a little bit uh, lower. So you're going to have a, a big coverage for the observable with less precision than what you get in all A. So the first observation of DVCS was simultaneously done at class and Hermes uh, at DAISY. So this is not my last slides. I just saw it. This is not my no. last version of the slides. And I don't know why. <laughs> because I had the log of Hermes and, I, and it was nice. No, I don't know. I don't remember what else I changed, but okay. uh, I don't know why. This is not my late. So there was the log of Hermes. Sorry, it was ah, it was kind of cute because it's the Greek god with the wings and so on. So anyway, so what you're gonna see a lot uh, it's all this sinus phi distribution. So I'm plotting here asymmetries. Asymmetry means a difference of cross section uh, uh, over a sum of cross section, and the cross section have a different spin uh, of the target or uh, elicity of the beam, okay? And this are, these are plots as a function of phi, that is that angle that I introduced earlier between the leptonic and the adronic plane. And if you remember the, um, uh, the composition in uh, harmonics in phi show that there were terms that depended on the sinus phi. So if you see that an asymmetry has a sinus phi dependence, this means that you are hitting on the interference term of the VCS beta idler. So this was like the, the signature that we were really measuring the VCS that was in the first observation. So it was very exciting and it was measured at the same time, published at the same time. You see it was in the same uh, uh, issue of PRL that both Hermes and class measured the uh, DVCS at once. And this was followed uh, a couple of years later from with the result uh, using polarized target of target uh, spin asymmetry. So these were uh, results, yes. The different curves are different model predictions. The band is the systematic uncertainty and these are different model predictions. 
So that's what we were doing. Uh, the first measurement of GPDs, all you can do is compare to a model, because I will talk about that later. But then when you start to measure a lot of observables with precision, you can try to extract the GPD in a model independent way directly from the data. But at the beginning, all you can do is use a model to compare and see which model your data are, are choosing or not. So uh, what these first measurements uh, showed, uh, showed that there was this dominance uh, of uh, the twist two handbag diagram, which means the interference term depending uh, uh, as a function of sinus phi. Uh, at the same time, they had low statistics. Uh, they were uh, integrated over all the kinematics. Uh, and there were uncertainties on the determination of the EP gamma final state, because you see here I'm green and it will change colors during the talk, but uh, I put uh, what we call the detection topology of the final state. The final state is EP gamma, and there are different ways in which you can measure EP gamma. You can measure all the three particles if your detector allows, if your luminosity allows, or you can measure just the part. So you measure the two electron and proton, and you try to reconstruct what we call the missing photon in the final state, or you measure the electron and the gamma and you reconstruct the missing proton, or here you measure everything, but then your uh, uh, efficiency is lower and uh, your statistics is gonna be low too. So these things will come back in the next slide. So these were the non-dedicated non -dedicated experiments to DVCS and then started a big uh, sequence uh, of uh, uh, dedicated experiments. Here I show the result of the measurement in all A. That was, it's already all this, 2006, by my colleague Carlos from Orsay. In this case, uh, all A was measuring the topology E gamma. So they had, uh, uh, this is connected to your question earlier, when you asked about uh, uh, which uh, um, kinematics had the photon, if you can distinguish between the beta Hitler and the DVCS one. So as I said, the photons tend to go the direction of the beam, the beta Hitler ones. So what they did in OLA is having a dedicated calorimeter to detect the photons at very low angles, low with respect to the beam direction. And this was done so that they could catch the beta Hitler uh, uh, photons and measure the interference. So what they did in OLA, they measured the Cross-section difference uh, with respect to the beam helicity, unpolarized cross-section, and they extracted a combination of quantum four factor. I'm sorry, uh, we don't see the y-axis here, and measured the Q square dependence, uh, the Q square evolution of this combination of quantum four factor. And you see that even if it's a small range of X that was measured, you can see that there is uh, basically no dependence in Q square, and this uh, reminds us of the scaling. So the process is really happening at the quark level if we don't have a Q squared dependence. So the beauty of this experiment, it, it was done with the high resolution and the high luminosity of all A, but there was a limited uh, phase space. So only a few kinematic points were sampled. And then came a dedicated experiment to DVCS in class. Um, the data were taken in 2005 and I was there, of course. And uh, we, like similarly to what was done in OLA, we had uh, to have we had to add a dedicated calorimeter to cover the small angles uh, in theta for the photon and get uh, the beta Hitler photons. Uh, and uh, what was measured was the beam spin asymmetry that has a particular sensitivity to the GPDH. And you see it plotted here again, sinus phi distribution. But here you see the beauty of class because unlike uh, OLA, we have a big uh, kinematic coverage with a lot uh, of uh, different beams. This is uh, X Bjorken as a function of Q square. And then we have also T distributions. You see the T distribution here. What is plotted is the sinus phi fit parameter from this distribution as a function of T for each Q square and X Bjorken beam. So this uh, again was uh, uh, compared to different uh, models. So we then measured uh, cross sections with the same data, data set for class and it's cross section, absolute cross section and cross section differences, which are sensitive to, again, to the H imaginary quantum for factor. And uh, um, we extracted these two observable on the largest uh, kinematics that was ever covered for DVCS with its experiment. 
And you will notice that uh, uh, the slope of this uh, delta uh, sigma distribution decreases, and you will uh, this will be connected to the findings that we made uh, using this data about the tomography of the proton. We also made uh, a measurement uh, on a longitudinally polarized target for the VCS on the proton. A couple of years later, it was 2009, and I was there, of course. <laughs> And this is an observable, the target, we, we extracted actually three observables from the same um, experiment. We had been seed asymmetry that was useful as a cross check to compare with the data that were published already. And then we measure longitudinal target asymmetry and the double asymmetry that uses both the target and the beam polarization. And we sampled the phase space with a wider binning. Here it's because the polarized target cannot run at the same luminosity uh, with which you run on polarized targets. So the experiment is going to have lower statistics. But it was the first time that we, sent, we measured the target spin asymmetry with this uh, coverage and precision. It was uh, 10 times more statistics that was measured before uh, and extended kinematic coverage. So once we got all this data, we started to think about uh, how, to, how can we extract the quantum factors directly from the data instead of, as I said earlier, relying on the comparison with models? And there are different uh, techniques and strategies that are uh, on the market to do this. So uh, there is the, the method of the local fits. Uh, so basically each kinematic bin is considered independently and in each kinematic bin, you express your observable as a combination of quantum four factors, and you fit the observable that are measured, leaving the quantum four factors as free parameters of the fit. So this is the method developed by my colleague, uh, Michel Guidal. Then there are global fits in which you take together all the kinematic beans. You have a parametrization of the GPDs as a function of the kinematics. And so what the fit parameters in this case are the parameters of the GPDs themselves. And you consider together all the observables. Then you can do a hybrid of the two, combining the two methods. And this is done to estimate the systematic uncertainties. And lately, there are new methods that are coming out of extracting GPDs using a neural network. And this has been already in the past used for PDFs, and it started recently to be used for GPDs. So the, um, the extractions that I will show after are based on the local fit of uh, Michel Guidal. This was uh, um, a model independent fit, as I said, for each kinematic bin. There are some uh, a slight model dependent assumption. Uh, here is the fact that you have so many unknown, so many free parameters that are the eight real and imaginary counter for factor for each of the four GPDs. So there is a loose bound on these parameters given by the prediction of a given model. So basically the parameters are bound plus minus five times the value that the model would say. So it's a quite loose bound that is done to avoid that the fits diverge. So putting together all the JLab um, data that I showed earlier, which were the um, class uh, cross-section, bin spin asymmetries, target spin asymmetry, and then the cross-sections from uh, OLA. Here you can see an extraction of, I'm sorry, you cannot really read, these parts are very faint. So this is the imaginary part of the GPDH, and each plot is plotted as a function of T, and each plot is a different kinematic bin uh, in Xi and Q square. And so you see here the evolution of your quantum four factor imaginary H. And you see that there is a, a variation in the slope in T changing the kinematics. It starts steeply here at the low values of Xi, which is linked to X Bjorken. And uh, so basically what we see is that the imaginary part of H has a flatter T slope at the high value of X, which means that the valence quark that are the fastest ones are focused at the core of the proton while the slowest one are at its uh, periphery. I'm saying this because there is a link between the T variable and uh, the, the impact parameter position. That's what I said before, and they are linked uh, via Fourier transform. So flat Fourier transform of something flat is something sharp. So uh, this is the first uh, visualization 
but I will show you better of the proton tomography. Similar conclusions were uh, drawn by looking at feeds uh, extracting the H tilde GPD, which is uh, in turn is a more complex uh, uh, link uh, to, um, to physical quantity. It's connected to the axial, axial charge. And given the slope uh, compared to the one of H, we can conclude that the axial charge is more concentrated than the electric one. And it's something that is measured in neutrino reactions. And I'm not going to go in detail of the axial charge if you were asking about that. Thank you. It's, <laughs> I decided to, because we have um, still a lot of slides and it's 10 to. So, um, Summarizing, this is a summary of all the observables that were measured, the uh, asymmetry of DVCS measured by Hermes and class. Uh, Hermes had the beauty that they could change uh, a beam between uh, uh, electron and positron, so they measured beam charge asymmetry, which is something that we cannot do yet at Jefferson Lab, but we are pushing to have a positron beam here too. And they had also transverse target spin asymmetry, which is something also that we will have to have uh, a JLab to complete the program. And uh, this image shows you the sensitivity to three different uh, uh, quantum four factor, depending on which experiment uh, you are using. So it's uh, imaginary part of H, imaginary uh, real part of H, and imaginary part of H tilde depending on whether or not you're using the OLA data, class data, and Hermes, you see the, which sensitivity to quantum for factors you can have. JLab uh, class, to, class sorry, had more sensitivity to the imaginary part of H thanks to the data on polarized target, and Hermes had a lot of sensitivity to the real part of H thanks to the beam charge asymmetry. And as I said, this thing, this uh, last thing is the motivation that pushes us to try to ask for a positron beam at Jefferson Lab, having more sensitivity to the real part of the GPDH. So um, uh, what, uh, yes? Yes, yeah, so basically if you have, um, when I showed you this set of uh, formulas here, uh, okay, here you are. So here, if you have, um, different lepton charges in the beam, you are sensitive to the real part instead of the imaginary part, and you do the asymmetry. So this is something that uh, is less constrained. As you see, all the other asymmetry are mainly sensitive to the imaginary part of the control factor. So if you want no information on the real part, you either have to measure a cross-section, but the cross-section will have parts that are strongly dominated by beta Eidler, or you do, uh, lepton charge asymmetries like that. So this is something that they did in uh, uh, Hermes. And when uh, you use those data to do the fits uh, to extract the GPDs, you see that there is actually a strong sensitivity on the real part of H. So we would like to do it at JLab too. And that's why we're going to ask, uh, we are trying to ask for a positron beam and talk about it tomorrow, I think. Okay, so visualizing the proton tomography. So basically, here putting together all the results of the local fits uh, to Hermes class and all the data, and then making some uh, model dependent assumptions to get out the X dependence. This image was constructed. This image has on the X axis, the longitudinal momentum fraction of the parton. And on this plane, uh, there are the transverse position of the parton. So you see uh, the valence quarks that are at high X are focused at the center of the parton and the C and the gluons are at the periphery. And uh, there has been recently a video that was made by, how do I get to it? By some colleagues at uh, MIT and JLab, they made a video to give you an idea of really what this proton tomography means. So uh, you will see we are changing the value, the value of X of the longitudinal momentum fraction starting from very low values and we are gonna go up. So we are starting from low values and you have a big extent in the transverse plane and we have all the C quarks and the gluon that are moving slowly. Then you increase X and you are starting to reduce the radial extent, you see? This is where the the partons are starting to go faster. And then you go uh, to the higher value 
of x it's going there and the radius has decreased even more and you have the, the valence quarks that are moving fast by themselves. So this is a visualization that was made of the results obtained from fitting the JLab and Hermes data on DVCS. Something else that has been done recently is trying to extract the distribution of the forces and the pressure uh, in the proton. One of the properties of GPDs that I showed in my previous lecture was this um, moment in X of the GPDH is connected to a sum of T-dependence terms. And this uh, term D1 is the uh, gravitational form factor of the energy momentum tensor, which gives us information about the shear forces and pressure in the proton. And um, what was done basically is here you have uh, the definition of the quantum form factor, and uh, you can relate um, the real and the imaginary part of the quantum form factor via a dispersion relation. This the dispersion relation will contain um, a subtraction term that is called the D term. And uh, D term basically is connected via, it's, it's complicated, but there is this expansion in Gegenbauer polynomial. And uh, the first term of this expansion in Gegenbauer uh, polynomial has been approximated as this D uh, factor here that gives the energy momentum tensor. And in turn, this is related via this integral to the distribution of the pressure in the proton. And D1 was extracted fitting, um, making some model dependent assumption and fitting data uh, from class at six GeV. And from that, uh, through this integral, uh, the distribution of the pressure as a function of the radius of the proton was extracted and it shows that uh, at um, small radii, there is a repulsive pressure, and uh, at bigger uh, radius, there is a confining pressure. So there is, this is a kind of a controversial result uh, that has, uh, there has been discussions after this paper came out about the method. So I wouldn't uh, stress too much about the final result of this, but uh, on the potential of this. So a, a knowledge of the real part, uh, of the, of the quantum for factor can give us knowledge on this D term and the D term in terms is, can be connected to the distribution of the pressure in the proton. So this put more um, emphasis on the importance of measuring the real part of the, of the quantum for factors. So then there has been uh, also uh, other uh, measurements at uh, OLA, which helped us to understand the role of those famous higher twist uh, uh, or uh, next to leading order uh, processes of which uh, I mentioned um, in the first lecture. So the precision of the uh, data in OLA, uh, of the cross-section and cross-section difference is such that uh, it can be discriminated uh, between different hypotheses of dominance of either the next to leading order or the higher twist uh, um, terms. And basically what this data showed is that at the low energies of JLab at 6 GV, there was a strong, not strong, but a sizable contribution of other diagrams of higher twist and next to leading order. So I'll uh, end on, oh, okay. <laughs> So DVCS on the new, should I finish this now or should I finish this tomorrow? Because this is my favorite part. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's my experiment. Uh, no, because uh, uh, it's okay. Probably, I don't know, up to you. Because then tomorrow it's another story. So I would like to do it today, but. Um... Okay, so basically, uh, so far we talked about the proton. But uh, as I said earlier, if we want to get the flavor dependency of the GPD, like it was done for the PD PDFs, we need to combine uh, the GPDs obtained with the VCS on the proton and on the neutron. And there is this uh, linear decomposition. Basically, if we want the UD quark, you measure the GPDs on the proton and the neutron, and then you have simple formulas to disentangle the quark contribution. And, uh, there is another interest behind the measurement of DVCS on the neutron is the fact that the beam spin asymmetry for NDVCS is the most sensitive observable to the GPDE. You saw a lot of what I showed until now was all about H. And H, frankly speaking, you know, 
it's <laughs> it's less interesting because uh, it's connected uh, in the forward limit to the PDFs that we know already. So it's not a fully unknown GPD. On the other hand, the GPD-E is totally unknown and unconstrained by other uh, quantities. And on the other hand, it's vital if we want to extract uh, the um, quark angular momentum contribution through this uh, GSAM rule. So it's important to measure NDVCS because it's sensitive in the spin asymmetry, it's sensitive to the GPD-E. And the similar sensitivity is obtained using a transversely polarized proton target, but this is a challenging experiment. And the VCS is challenging too, but uh, a bit less probably. So um, there was a, a pioneering experiment, a neutron DVCS that was carried out in OLA at 6 GV. You don't have a free neutron target. You need to use a deuterium target. And what they did in OLA is measuring um, DVCS with only electron and photon in the final state on deuterium and subtracting data taken on hydrogen to get uh, the neutron component out. And uh, this observable that they extracted was the cross-section difference that is sensitive, as I said before, to the GPDE. However, the first measurement was plagued by low statistics and high systematics. They extracted this combination of quantum four factor and it looked more or less compatible with zero. They tried to look at models making different uh, hypotheses about the values of the uh, quark angular momentum, JU and JD that you see here. And so they put some model dependent constraints on the values of JU and JD and put together this uh, with the results from Hermes on transverse uh, polarized target. They made some first uh, model independent uh, hypothesis on the value of the quark's angular momentum. So this experiment, no matter its limit, it showed the, the importance of the measurement of uh, uh, neutron DVCS for the understanding of the quark's angular momentum. And then there was another experiment at 6 GV. In this case, it didn't uh, have polarization, so they didn't measure the asymmetry, so no uh, direct access to E, but what they did, they proved that, that they could uh, extract a, a non-zero cross-section of the DCS while the previous experiment was not conclusive in this sense. So this was a big uh, uh, step ahead, and I will uh, come to my summary, like, and the rest will come tomorrow. So DVCS is the reaction that uh, more directly is interpretable in terms of GPDs. And uh, by measuring the interference of DVCS and beta Heitler, we uh, depend linearly on the quantum four factors and can be accessed experimentally with spin asymmetry. We had uh, Klass and Hermes providing the first DVCS bit Heitler interference evidence. And since then, we had a lot of experiment carried out at GLAB at 6 GB. Asymmetries for target, uh, beam, uh, double, single, cross-section, uh, precision, and everything. And we extracted the first tomographic image of the proton. First glance at the pressure distribution in the proton and the neutron DVCS from OLA showed the importance of this channel to extract the JU and JD, the, um, the quarks uh, contribution to the nucleon spin. And we also had the first observation on non-zero cross-section for neutron DVCS. Thank you.